welcome to St. Peter's Church and we're going to take you on a little adventure today going through the church but we're going to start right here at these gates wow have you seen these gates these big pillars with the lights on top and they're so cool and this is just our entrance to take us up towards the church so I'm Andy and Reverend Martin's inside the church waiting for us so we'd love to take you on this journey so you just follow me and we'll head this way come on come me The bells you hear maybe sometimes on a Sunday morning, that's where they rang from up there. Wow, it's so high! Can you see this entrance? Can you see the doorway with the arch? Isn't that so cool? Are these doors are where they go into the church, but can you see the stone? It might, it might not be like the stones and the bricks in your house because this is really, really old. This stone is a really long time ago and it's, it's all sandstone, which is different to our normal bricks. Um, maybe if you come down here one day, you can feel it. You can the difference. But we're going to show you inside. So you come with me and we pop inside because I'm sure there's some loads of good things in here. Come on, come with me. Arches. Wow, this looks so amazing. I bet there's loads of things to explore. Should we take you in? Come on, come with me. come and sit when we come to church. They haven't always got to be like this. Sometimes they are seats, but in this church, they wouldn't pews. So there's a word for you to remember, pews. And in these, the people sit, and the reason they're important is because this church is not about the building. The church is more about the people that sit in these pews, because God says that the church is us, the people that come here to worship. Wow, isn't that amazing? Wow, wow, wow. Um, wow. See nothing over there. You go and find out what that is. Well, hello, and welcome to St. Peter's Church, or at least the church building. I know Andy's welcomed you. It isn't this amazing. It's a fantastic building. Sometimes, you know, people think I actually live here. I don't live here. I live in the house next door, but I do work here. And I'm often here on a Sunday and other days helping people meet with God in this particular building. Now, I know you've already had a look around. It's amazing as a building. I wonder if you can guess how old do you think this building is? Do you think it's uh, 10 years old or um, 20 years old or even 50 years old or maybe 100 years old? That's really old, isn't it? Do you want to guess? Let me tell you. This building is 144 years old. That's an awful lot of birthdays, isn't it? And an awful lot of candles on a birthday cake. But in fact, Christians have been worshipping here in this place for much, much longer uh, than that. What I'm going to do now is we're going to show you around some of the fantastic things in this building. And I think Andy pointed you over there. I'm going to follow you over here. And we're going to start over here and see what you think this is. Or what's on here? I wonder if you can guess what we're going I pull it out and you see, oh, it's really heavy. <coughs> this is a massive book. I wonder if you can guess what book this is. Is this um, the Gruffalo? No, it's not the Gruffalo. Is it um, Harry Potter? No, it's not Harry Potter. I bet you've guessed. This is a Bible. It's a really big, big Bible. And it stands on this lectern. You might try and remember those words, a Bible and a lectern. 
And this is a really special book for Christians when we come to worship. We read this book because we believe that this is God's word and that he speaks to us through it. And so I'm going to read with you just a little bit of this book. So uh, come with me and we'll just sit down over here. Now actually, although I said this is a book, it's not really a book. It's a library. This is a book with 66 different books in it, one after the other. It's like a library. And each of those books has a name. You might like to uh, get a Bible and look at it and you'll find the names of each book at the top of the page usually. So we're going to turn to one book in the Bible which has the name Matthew. And it's got the name Matthew because it was written by a man called Matthew. And I'm going to read to you just some of the things that he wrote down. He was a friend of Jesus and he listened to Jesus teaching and he wrote down some of the things that Jesus said. And we read from this book in church and Christians read it at home so that God can speak to us, so that we can learn about Jesus. And hearing what he says, we can put that into practice in our daily lives. And that's exactly what this story is about. So this story is called The Parable of the wise and foolish builders. So here goes, it goes like this. Jesus said, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. You might make some actions and think of a wise man building his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and the house on the rock did not fall because it had its foundation built on rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. You might build your house on the sand. The rain came down the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. See how much noise you can make as the house falls with a crash. It fell with a great crash. When Jesus finished saying this, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not like their other teachers of the law. What an amazing story. Jesus is comparing two ways of building our lives. The wise man who builds his house on the rock and the foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And when life gets difficult, the man who built his house on the sand, what did it do? It fell with a great crash. And that's why we read the Bible in church and why Christians read the Bible. Because we want to build our lives on a rock a foundation which is solid and firm. So maybe you'd like to pick up, perhaps you haven't got a really big one like this, maybe you've got one like this, or perhaps you've even got one on a phone or a tablet or something like that. Pick up your Bible, see if you can find the book of Matthew, and see if you can find the number seven, which will lead you to that story about the wise and foolish builders. Now, if we're teaching from the Bible in church, I don't sit on the floor like this. Sometimes we go somewhere else. I'm gonna take you there now. It's up there. So do you wanna come with me up to, well, I'll find out what it is in a moment and see where we go. Hello. Can you guess what this is called? Maybe you can ask your teacher, see if they know what this is called. This is called a pulpit. And sometimes when we're teaching in church, we come and stand up here. And do you get why we stand up here? We stand up here so that the people sat out there can hear us when we're speaking, because some of them are such a long way away right at the back. Okay, but not always do we use the pulpit. Sometimes we do speak from down here, so I'm going to come down there as well. And we would stand here to be a bit nearer to the people so that they can hear us. 
But all the time we're trying to open up God's word in the Bible so that people can understand what Jesus teaches us and so we can live as his followers. Well, do you go somewhere else now? Let me take you and see if we can find Andy. I wonder where he's over there. Come with me. Hi again, it's me. But wasn't that interesting that Reverend Martin told us about the Bible and about the lectern and the pulpit, three big words that we can learn. Um, well, another thing we do, we don't just preach from the Word, we don't just read the Bible when we come to church, but we like to, to worship with our song and with our singing. And there's lots of ways we can do that, and one of those ways is we use one of these. I wonder if you've seen one of these before. And you see these pipes up here, these big gold pipes. And that's where the sound comes from. This is a pipe organ and it's used to play in church. You, you may have heard it if you've been to a wedding or a celebration in church and you may have heard this being played. Um, I'm going to give it a go now. Should we, should we see what it sounds? I'm going to sit, sit across here. Ooh, it's exciting. I've never played one of these before. Can you have a look what it sounds like? Yeah, and down here there's lots of buttons and knobs and right now there's nothing coming out but you have to choose between different sounds so I'm gonna pull this one can you see that it's called trumpet so should we see what that sounds like ready that's a trumpet sound and it has, it has these keys up here but it also if you look down here on the floor it's got your keys for your feet, just the same as up here. And these buttons are over this side. So if I pull one out, should we have a listen to what this sounds like? So this one goes. That's low, isn't it? Should we have a listen again? And if you play them together, it can sound like this. Isn't that clever? Should we have a see what some of the other sounds do? Press that one in. If you try this one, this one's a piccolo. You ready? Ooh. That's a high squeaky one, isn't it? Should we have a look at one of these others? What have we got? Oh, celestial. This is talking about angel y type sounds. Should we have a listen to what they sound like? Can you hear that? It's quite quiet actually, isn't it, that one? It's a lovely sound, but all these sounds can be played from this pipe organ and people sing, people sit just behind here, it's called the choir, sit behind you and they sing. And we sing as an act of worship to God, to tell God how amazing he is. This is an organ and uh, lots of churches still have these. And we still use them sometimes in the morning and sometimes in weddings and things like that. But we don't just use an organ to sing worship and sing praises to, to God. We use other things as well. Should we go and find out what some of those are? Come on, let's head off. Wasn't that great fun playing that organ? But like I said, there's loads of other things we use. Have a look at this right here. We've got a keyboard, which is like an organ but it's slightly more modern and slightly smaller so we can move it around the place. So we use this in some of, most of our, some of our Sunday services and uh, we've got our microphone so we can sing into. And over here we've got this whole space on the, on the stage or on the platform here where we can sing and we often have guitars playing. We'll have a look at these around here. Check these out. We've got a drum kit or an electric drum kit. Shall we have a listen to our electric drum kit? Because the Bible says that it's good to, to make, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. So it's good to play all our instruments and sing as loud as we can. So, oh. Oh, did you hear that? <laughs> Isn't that really cool? We like that. We love the drums and we use all these different instruments to worship God and like we said to tell him how amazing he is. Well 
some other things in this church, which are, there's so many of, are these amazing windows which you might see dotted around. You can see them from the outside, but especially when you come in because the light shines through them. They're called stained glass windows. And just if you turn around over there, Reverend Martin's going to explain what some of them are. And uh, yeah, as Andy was saying, this is a really good example of a stained glass window. This one, if you look at it, I wonder whether you can guess what this is a picture of. If you look at it really carefully, I'm sure you can probably guess what you can see in this picture. Right in the middle here is a little baby. And I'm sure that you can guess that this is a picture of Jesus when he was born as a baby. And there's his uh, mother Mary, uh, she's dressed in blue, often in windows, Mary is pictured in blue. Here is Joseph kneeling at the manger where the baby is born. And then on this side, I wonder who you can think these are. There's a bit of a clue if you can see what animal that is there. That's a sheep. And so these must be, you're right, they're shepherds. And I think the shepherds on the other side as well with another sheep down here. That's a reminder that when we read the Bible about the story when Jesus was born, some of the first people to come and see him were the shepherds. So this is a picture to remind us about the birth of Jesus. And often there are stained glass windows in churches to help people remember and learn the stories of Jesus. In days gone by, not everyone could read, not everyone could afford to buy a book. And so perhaps they could come into church and they'd be reminded of some of those stories of Jesus by looking at the windows. So this is the birth of Jesus. We, of course, celebrate that at Christmas. But over there is another window depicting another time in Jesus's life. So uh, I'll go over there and you can see what that picture is too. Here's another picture of Jesus and the picture of his resurrection when he rose from the dead. Can you see Jesus in the middle? And on either side, there are two people. They're in strange clothes, aren't they? And they, they look like they're asleep. These are the Roman soldiers who thought maybe fell asleep at the time that Jesus rose from the dead. And you can see a picture of his tomb as a kind of coffin shape and Jesus standing in the middle. And then how about this window here? This is, a, this is the newest window in the church. This has uh, lots of people gathered around the bottom. I guess you can see them. And then there's a picture of, well, obviously Jesus in the middle. And on either side, there are two angels. I wonder what it is about them that means we can tell that they're angels. Look, they're in bright colors, aren't they? They're in white and yellow. And uh, yeah, they got wings. Don't know, <laughs> but you can see they're welcoming Jesus as he's raised up into heaven. So this is a picture about the time when Jesus was taken up into heaven. Let's now go to the front of church, and here's our biggest window, and it's the one that people see most of the time because it's right down the front. And if you look at this, I wonder what you can see in it. Just have a look and see what you can see. What can you see first? What's in the middle? Who's in the middle? Well, again, it's a picture of Jesus, isn't it? But it's a picture of Jesus at the time that he died, when he was crucified, when he was killed on a cross. That's a horrible way for someone to die. But it's a reminder to us of just how much God loves us, that he was willing to suffer and die for us. But Jesus isn't the only picture in the person in this picture, is he? Can you count the number of crosses? How many can you see? I can see one in the middle uh, with Jesus, and then there's one on either side, isn't there? So that makes one, two, Three, because we know that when Jesus was crucified, there were two people, two thieves, two criminals who were crucified with him. And they're in this picture too. Together, this reminds us that Jesus suffered and died for us. And so we can be sure that God loves us. Hello again. And, and that was really interesting about those windows, wasn't it? Do you remember this window that Reverend Martin spoke about with those crosses on the window and why those crosses are there? 
Because Jesus died on a cross to forgive all the wrong things that we will ever do. So a cross to us, even though it wasn't a nice thing back then, a cross to us is a symbol of hope and a symbol and a sign that we are forgiven and that all the mistakes, all the wrong things we do can be forgiven because of what Jesus did on the cross. Now the cross, we have them as a line going down, but they had one stick going down and one going across. And that is the shape of the cross. There are loads of crosses around this church. This one here is a nice gold looking one. This is really special, isn't it? I mean, you've seen the ones in the stained glass window earlier. I wonder if you can spot any other crosses as we walk around the church. Shall we have a look? Come on. There's one right there. Did you spot that? That was a little bit trickier, wasn't it? These are on the ends of these poles, which are sometimes carried up and down this aisle as we come in. And if you look down here on the floor, can you spot those other crosses down there? These are called kneelers, and they're there for people when they're praying, they can kneel down on the floor without hurting their knees. And they tend to have crosses on them as well, because when we're praying, it's good to remember what Jesus has done for us. And one other way, or a really important way to remember what Jesus did to us, is we take communion. Reverend Martin, I think, is just behind you, and he's gonna explain what that is all about. Should we head that way now? Come on, come on. Hello there. Hello. If you come down to see what happens at this end of the church, this is a really special part of our church building. Now this is either called an altar or a communion table. And here we do something really special that Jesus taught his followers to do in order to remember him. There was a time just before Jesus died, do you remember that? Remember that picture of the cross just above us, the time when Jesus died? Well, just shortly before that happened to him, he was sharing a meal with his friends. Now, it would have been a proper meal. They'd have had some real proper food to eat as well. But on the table, there would have also been some bread and some wine. And Jesus took that bread and took that wine and he did something very special with it and told his friends and followers to do it again and again and again in order to remember him. And so that's what we do sometimes when we come into church, we take bread and wine and we use it to remember Jesus. So uh, have a look here, I've got it under here. Sometimes we use real bread like you would have at home for your toast and breakfast. But actually at some of our services, we use a piece of bread that looks like this. And we do exactly what Jesus told us to do. We take it, we give thanks, and then we break it. And having broken it, we then share it, giving each person a piece of bread. So these little bits here are some of the little bits of bread that we use to give to people. And Jesus said to do that, to remember that on the cross, his body was broken and given for us. And then the other thing we do is we take a cup. And in this cup, well, I wonder if you know what goes in this cup. Can you remember, because I have just said, haven't I? It's not orange juice, it's not water. It's a very special type of wine. As I pour it in, see if you can see what color it is as it goes into the cup. Can you see? There you go. It's a red wine. And it's a red wine to remember that when the nails went into Jesus's hands and feet, his blood uh, seeped out, poured out, that his blood was shed for us. These are two ways of remembering that Jesus died for us. And by feeding on in our hearts to be thankful for his love 
for us. And as we share together, we remember that because of Jesus, we are all united as one people, his body, the church. And so some Sundays I'll come and stand here. Sometimes I'll wear some funny clothes in order to do it, some special robes to remind us that this is something really special. And we take the bread, we take the wine, we give thanks to God, especially for Jesus, and we share it with everybody here to remember that together we are part of Christ's body, Jesus' body, and together we can have peace with God and peace with each other. Now that's really, really special, isn't it? Okay, well, we've come to the end of our journey around St. Peter's Church here, and I hope you've had a really good time. I hope you've learned some new words and some learned some things that we maybe do here. Um, do you remember the pulpit? Do you remember what happens in the pulpit? Yes, when we preach the word, yes, we tell people about God from the pulpit. And we've got the lectern over there. Do you remember what was sitting on the lectern? That's right, it was the Bible and Reverend Martin read us that story from Matthew, which was fantastic. And maybe you can find that again. Um, we looked at ways we worship God and ways we sing. Do you remember what they were? They are indeed. We've done the pipe organ back there. We looked at the keyboard and we also looked at drums. They were nice and loud and noisy. We loved those things. And then right at the end, we finished off with a really important part of our worship which was communion, remembering what Jesus did for us. Great, so I hope you've enjoyed it. We really hope that next time you can actually come yourself into the building and that you'll be allowed to do that because we would love to welcome you in person and not just have to show you around by video. But in the meantime, really big thank you for joining us from our Andy and I, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye. Bye. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed your tour of St. Peter's Church. Andy and I have certainly enjoyed showing you around and hopefully some of the things we've said and done will help you to know a little bit more about this building and a little bit more about what goes on here when Christians use it for worship. But some of you have very kindly written in and asked some questions and so I'm gonna do my best to answer some of those uh, for you now. So Harry, yours is the first question. You ask, do you live there, Reverend Martin? That's a really good question, Harry. Lots of children ask me that when they first come here. No, I don't live here at St. Peter's Church. I do work here, so I come here on a Sunday to lead worship here for the people who gather here. And I'm here for other meetings that sometimes use this building. But lots of my work takes me elsewhere, St. Peter's Centre, when I've been able to come up to your school and to other schools or visiting people in their homes. But I don't actually live here. I live in the house which is next door uh, to here and it's called the rectory. Ah, this one's a really good question. This is from Bethany. Who cleans the roofs? Who cleans the roof? Well, the honest truth is I don't know actually who cleans them, but it's a big building with lots of roofs. So I've got something really special for you now. Uh, just last week, uh, one of our young people flew his drone up over St. Peter's Church. So I'm gonna give you some pictures. Now, here they come. Here are some pictures that he took from his drone of the roof of St. Peter's Church. Isn't it fantastic? What a great view there is looking out from high up in the sky over the church building. And you can see just how big uh, the roof is. So we do have a workman who looks after our roof and who cleans the gutters. Um, his name is uh, Martin as well, actually. But what a fantastic view you get flying up uh, above the roof. Hi, back again. Uh, here's the next question. Uh, why do we have a cross on a Bible? Why do we have a cross on a Bible? Well, hopefully we've shown you as we've been around the building, lots of crosses uh, in this building. Actually, our Bible doesn't have a cross, but you're right, many do. And that's because the cross is the most well-known symbol of the Christian faith. It reminds us that Jesus died on a cross uh, when he was crucified on a cross. Do you remember the crosses? In fact, there's one, if you look behind me, on the table just up there, you can just see it. Uh, 
it's a picture of, of the, the kind of shape uh, that was used when Jesus died. And it's a reminder uh, to Christians of Jesus and his love for us when he died for us. And so sometimes you do find one on the front of a Bible. Good question. That was Oscar H's question. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, now, why do we have pictures on the windows? Why do we have pictures on the windows? Again, let me take you to some of the windows. I can do that. Let me show you some of the windows. Here they go. Right. It is true that many of the windows in St Peter's Church have pictures on them. And they're often pictures which tell us some of the stories of Jesus. In days long gone by, not everyone learned to read. And so often the windows were used to provide people with pictures to learn the stories of Jesus. So this picture you can see here, this is the one I put on your worksheet to look at as well. It's a picture of Jesus's birth, which we remember at Christmas. So if you look in the middle, you can see the baby Jesus. And there's two people on either side, a woman and a man. So you might guess that that's Jesus's mum, Mary, and his earthly father, Joseph. And then if you look on the sides, you'll see some other people and if you look very carefully, you might see in their arms, at their feet, an animal. Look carefully, you can see what animal it is. Yeah, it's a sheep, isn't it? So these are shepherds. And that's because we read in the Bible that shepherds came to visit Jesus when he was first born. So this picture is about the birth of Jesus. Let me go to one other picture. This is a picture where you see what you can see in this picture. You can see some people can you see the boat in this picture? There's the sail of a boat in this picture, isn't there? And you can see the water that it's floating on. This is a picture of the time when Jesus came to call his first disciples. They were fishermen. So they were fishing by Lake Galilee. And Jesus came up to them and said, come follow me. From now on, you're going to stop fishing for fish and start catching people, drawing people into God's work. So this is a picture that remembers that event. And we've got this picture in our building. Well, you should be able to guess that because our building is called what? St. Peter's Church. Your school is called what? St. Peter's School. This is a picture of the time when Jesus called St. Peter. And if you come to church on another time, you'll see there's lots of other pictures around the room, around the building that you can look at. So uh, welcome back. Nice to see you again. Lucy asks, is there a play area at St. Peter's? Is there a play area at St. Peter's? Uh, actually, yes, there is. It's at the back of church right over there. We call a creche because it's really only for very small children. But we want to think that the church is a place where everybody is welcome including you, including older boys and girls, younger boys and girls, and even little babies. And so we do have a little play area with some toys for very small children so that they and their parents or carers can come and share with us in our services here. Zach asks, why do people go on a stage? Why do people go on a stage? Well, do you remember, Zach, when I showed you the pulpit? One of the reasons I said that churches have a pulpit is it lifts people up so that they can see who's speaking and also so they can hear who's speaking. In days gone by, they didn't have microphones to make people's voices louder. So pe the people speaking and teaching needed to speak really loudly so that everyone in the building could hear them. And even the people at the back needed to be able to see and hear them. So we have a little stage at the front. So anyone who's at the front, whether they're reading the Bible, whether they're leading us in our prayers, whether they're playing some kind of music, um, we can see them and hear them. It means that everybody can join in. Uh, Beatrice, you ask, is there a table in church? Well, actually, if you look behind me, you can see that that's there behind me. It's called a communion table. Some churches call it an altar. Uh, but it's the table on which we place a cup and a plate with some bread on it and in which we use that bread and the wine in the cup, especially to remember Jesus. It reminds us that the last meal that Jesus shared with his disciples on earth, probably round a table of some sort, 
He took bread and broke it. He took wine and shared it and said, do this in remembrance of me. So some Sundays I use that table that you can see there behind me in order to do that. And here in this church, we call that Holy Communion. And on your worksheet, there's a picture of that table and a suggestion that you draw the cup that we would use and the plate uh, with some bread on it uh, as a picture uh, of, the, of the table. Good question, Beatrice. Emily asks, what music do they play? What music do they play? OK, so see if you can think in your class. Can you remember the name of the instrument that Andy was sitting playing? The one where he pulled the stops out to make the different sounds, the sound of the trumpet, the sound of the piccolo, that very gentle tremolo sound, or that really loud thumping sound. That instrument had a special name, didn't it? It had pipes that made the sound. Can you remember what it was? It was an organ, wasn't it? It was an organ. And then there was another instrument that Andy played, and you saw that in church as well. That was the doom, the drums. And sometimes Andy comes and plays his guitar. Sometimes we have people play a cajon, uh, we have people play a flute, uh, a violin. All kinds of different instruments have been used here uh, to help us worship God, to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Theo asks, do you have a font and what is it for? Now that's a really good question, Theo, because that was something we didn't talk about, did we, when we showed you around the building? So I'm going to bring up a picture of the font now. There it is. Here it is. This is the font. And we use this when someone is baptised. There's a little, uh, little bowl in the top of the font into which we put some water. You always have to have water when someone is baptised. And you pour the water, either sometimes it's a little baby over their head, or sometimes it's a grown up adult or a young person, which case you pour it over them as they stand next to the font. And that water symbolises how willing God is to cleanse us, to wash us, to forgive us of the wrong things that we do and to give us new life. So just as you use water to water plants and make them grow, just as you need to drink water in order to go on living, so the water of baptism is a symbol of the new life that God offers to us. And for a baptism, we put the water in this font here. Hi there, welcome back. Why do you need chairs? asks Bella. Well, that's because the church is really its people and we love to welcome people together. So we have chairs, some of them are red chairs. You can see one sat there behind me. It's over there, isn't it, a chair. Can you remember what the wooden seats are called that people sit on in church? Can you remember? I'm not gonna tell you this time. I'm gonna let you share that with one another. And again, on our worksheet, there's a picture of those, what they're called, and it asks you to draw some of the people sat on the, there you go. See if you can remember what that name is for those special wooden benches that people sit on. And then the last question is by Emily B. Emily asks, I never get to go to church ever. Can we go? Well, of course you can, Emily. We would love to welcome you here at St Peter's and I'm sure any other church would love to welcome you too. You would always uh, be welcome. So hopefully at some stage, you will get to come to St Peter's as part of your school. Uh, the school comes here, but well, ordinarily we'll come here for Christmas and harvest and Easter and at the end of the school year. So hopefully at some time in your school at St Peter's, you'll get to come to St Peter's Church uh, and we can welcome you here. But any Sunday, any of you would be welcome uh, to St Peter's to come and share in our worship. At the moment, you can also share in our worship online. You can find it on your computer or your mum and dad's phone or a laptop or something like that and share with us at this particular time from home as well. But we would love to welcome you to the building sometime. So I hope that's been really helpful. Andy and I have really enjoyed uh, coming into your classroom and sharing with you a little bit about St Peter's Church and what goes on here. And hopefully one day you will get to come here, we'll get to meet you properly in person and we'll be back being able to visit you in school. But in the meantime, have a really good day, enjoy the rest of your lesson and I'll see you again soon.
by 